Let's go to this now. There's been mixed reaction to the passing of apartheid-era minister Adrian Flock. He passed away on Sunday at the age of 85. Now, he was found guilty and sentenced for the attempted murder of Reverend Frank Chikani. He's also admitted to the bombing of Kosatu's headquarters during the National Party rule. At the same time, a number of people have remembered him as, some, as someone who tried to make some kind of atonement in his latter years. Let's now speak to Reverend Frank Chikani. Um, who is an author as well as an ANC veteran. Reverend, thank you so much for your time this evening. Let's start with your reaction to his passing. Reverend, you are on mute. Unfortunately, if you can unmute yourself. Okay, can you hear me? You can yes, hear me now. We yeah. can hear you now. Thank no, you. I, I just thank you very much. And uh, to your listeners and those who are watching the show, I just want to start by expressing my condolences to the family of Adrian Flock. Uh, we all have to remember that whatever happened, Adrian Flock has a family, children, grandchildren, and we need to express our condolences mm -hmm. to uh, them. Uh, secondly, I just want to say, I mean, he was old. He had reached a stage where most of us, in any way, would go at that age, and uh, we need to accept that as well. Uh, Adrian Fox's history, of course, it's uh, different from many of his own political uh, colleagues uh, who participated in the brutalization of our people, uh, harassed them, killed them, assassinated them, detained many of them, tortured them. And I'm one of those who were victims of this. Uh, but there was the additional issue about my poisoning, which was a direct act that was com com I mean, the pay instruction of the president of the time, P.W. Botha at that time. And uh, Mr. Flock was the minister. And they had these chemical weapons that were configured to be used against individuals. Mm. And the military was supposed to use them against those who were in exile and, and the police had to use it against those who were in the country. So I was a target of the police. And that's how actually my case then come up. I believe that many people died because of those chemicals. Not much attention has been paid on it. I also, I, I lament the fact that even when they submitted a list of the chemicals ordered with the dates and etc., none in the public or media have actually looked at this list and said, why, who would have died out of this particular chemical? But the difference with Mr. Flo is that uh, when I realized that his foot soldiers were being identified, he came to me and said, they won't go to prison without him. So if they are going to prison, he will go with them. Yeah. But then he started the process of uh, apologizing to me, um, asking for forgiveness. That's history now. It's recorded. And uh, we ended up in court, as you would, exp you, you would know. Um, the three policemen, the commissioner of police, Van der Mer, the former, and the minister in court where they were given five to 15 years sentences and um, uh, but suspended sentences. And so we went through that process, but there is the other process of forgiveness and, and, and yeah. him trying his best to make sure that he shows that he has, is really um, repentant about what he had done. And uh, including going to the Cossas families who were killed, including going to communities which were in need and he distributed food and other things. He just tried his best. But I mean, the damage was done during the apartheid system. And, and, and Reverend, for you, um, you know, how important was it for you to, to, to forgive, to reach that place in you? Because a number of people, as they reflect on his legacy, they, they, they still are battling to reconcile, um, you know, what you call uh, forgiveness, what you have done. And they say that for them, it's something that is simply not possible. So how important was it for you to get to that point? 
No, it, it was very important. I think I've always said I don't expect other people who are brutalized to do it the way I did it. Mm. The point is that for me, it's a spiritual thing. It's a thing about my healing and, and about my soul and state of health. And I, in my counseling, I always tell people, keeping bitterness and being angry, it's not good for your health. And so I decided I was going to forgive them. I'm not going to be a prisoner of my torturers or tormentors. Um, I, I'm going to free myself from them. And my view is that I forgive them. They've done it. We were fighting. It was in a war situation, and they did terrible things. And I said I've forgiven them so that I, they are not a burden to me. Uh, and I think that's that's what we need to think about, that we need to build a new society and and uh, holding on those grudges and anger that doesn't give us a good health. Obviously, we have to deal with the consequences of apartheid, mm. which is a different subject which says, and I keep on saying, if what Flock tried to do was done by the leadership of the white community as we settled politically and the, the white business community, we would not be where we are today because people would have said, we benefited out of apartheid, we now have a political settlement, let's work together to change the conditions of lives of our people. And I think that's where people find it difficult to forgive because they are still living under those conditions. And, and, and also, that's why we, yeah. Pardon yeah. me, pardon me, Reverend, for, for, for coming in there. Right on that point, you know, we're still seeing some of the families, um, you know, of those who were killed during that time saying that they're still crying for reparations. They're still crying, um, you know, for some kind of recognition. That in and itself is going to prolong the process of healing. Yeah, no, 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 no. I mean, there are challenges. We had challenges from the start, 1994. Um, I mean, we went through the debate about uh, reparations, the debate of finding mm. uh, those who have disappeared, who are assassinated, and the project is still on now. But the issue of reparation is very complicated. You couldn't actually get money to pay a certain amount for every victim of the apartheid system, which will be all of us. And so that's why for me, it's more about those who benefited out of the apartheid system mm. uh, would have made a difference by investing parts of what they benefited to change the conditions of lives of people, grow the economy. Uh, make sure there's employment, make sure black people participate fully in the economy in a productive way. Uh, make sure they become part of the owners rather than workers only. And I think that's where we missed the point. And that's where I kept on saying about Mr. De Klerk. He was the leader at that time. He missed the opportunity of calling on all those who benefited out of apartheid to say we're going to work together with the new in a new society to change the conditions of people so that we can be able to forgive each other and build into the future. But that has not happened. It was black leadership that had to struggle to achieve that objective, which has been very difficult. And Reverend, as you know, we take a step back and look at history and where things are now. Take us back to that moment when, you know, the, the now late Adrian Flock is washing your feet. Describe that moment mm. for us and, and, and for you, what was happening? What were some of the conversations? Yeah, well, I don't like repeating, you know, I actually, when I heard that um, Adrian Flock is passed away, I knew I'm going to be made to repeat again the pain we went through, which I would like to go past it. Mm. But I mean, he, he came, he, uh, he did not say he's going to come and wash my feet. Uh, he arrived in the office, said he wanted to talk to me at the union buildings. And it is when he was there, he then opened his uh, plastic bag because he, he had to make sure that he goes through security and he took out a scuttle key and asked for, asked first for a glass of water. 
he asked for a glass of water and I made, made sure he gets a glass of water. Instead of drinking it, he takes out his plastic squattle key and, and asks and pulls out the towel and asks to wash my feet. And I said, but why should he do that? He says it's his way of showing uh, his remorse and would like to be forgiven. I said to him, no, I forgave you long ago. Mm. I've gone past that stage and you don't have to worry about that. What we should worry is about the future. And he said, well, can you allow me to wash your feet for my own sake? You don't need it, but I need it. Mm. And it is at that point when I realize it's about him and I need to assist him. And that's how it happened. But you know, the implications about that is that you also get humbled in the process. I mean, mm. taking out your shoes and socks and, you know, in your office, it's, it's quite a dramatic thing to do. But it indicated the level to which he was prepared to go. And I'm just saying, I wish mm. that the leadership of that time could have taken that stand, not to go and wash people's feet. He has tried to wash everybody's feet. But to actually participate in correcting uh, the injustices of the past and making sure that people were victims and their generations to come don't remember of it based on the pain they continue experiencing but in terms of the changes that have happened. And Reverend, very briefly then, as we round up our conversation, someone is watching tonight and they're battling to get to the place where you got to, which is a place of forgiveness, as yeah. you say, and you say that you'd like them to move past it. What do you say then to them tonight? Well, I just want to say that, you see, the problem is that we start with victims mm. and we expect them to do certain things when the victimizers do nothing. Hmm. And I think it's important to say we need as South Africans, black and white, to work together to change the conditions of the victims of apartheid or historical victims. We need those who benefited, which are mainly white, to make a, a radical contribution to say we're going to make a contribution. If I was going to make my profits in six months, if it will take me 20 months to make the same profit, but bring more people participating in the economy, I will sacrifice that. I'm not saying give away everything you have, but mm. design, let's design uh, the participation in the economy in a way that helps more people to be where they should be. And I think we can do it as South Africans. It's not impossible. We just have to stop the blame game and go straight into making the difference that we should make. Um, and I'm still hoping that we can. But I just want to say for those of us who are victims, we must not wait for the victimizer to act as, as a charitable act. We have to pull up our socks and make sure that we change this country. Whether or not they come to the party or not, that's not the issue. The issue is that this is our country and we're going to make it. And it's a resourceful country. It's not a poor country. All right. Instead of participating by enriching few individuals and at the expense of the majority of the people with sewer running in the streets, we need to stop that and say the resources of the country are going to be invested in changing the conditions of lives of the people. So I just don't want us to wait for the historical oppressors to do something and we do nothing. All but right. I'm challenging those who benefited to join hands with us and change this country. I believe we have an opportunity to do it. Thank you so much, Reverend, uh, for those reflections. Do appreciate your time this evening. That's uh, Reverend Frank Chikana, author and uh, ANC veteran.